thank you to the campaign for the accountability of American bases. I know you share my view that accountability of American bases would lead to elimination of American bases. And thank you to Lindis for sending me her accounts of refusing to be arrested unless the police disarm themselves. In the United States, refusing any sort of direction from a police officer will get you charged with the crime of refusing a lawful order, regardless of whether the order is lawful. In fact, that is often the only charge levied against people ordered to cease protests and demonstrations that in theory are completely legal. And of course, telling a U.S. police officer to disarm could get you quite easily locked up for insanity if it didn't get you shot. <laughs> Can I just say how wonderful it is to be outside the United States of America on the 4th of July? There are, there are many wonderful and beautiful things in the United States, including my family and friends, including thousands of truly dedicated peace activists, including people bravely going to prison to protest the murders by drone of others they are never going to meet in distant lands whose loved ones will probably never hear about the sacrifices the protesters are making. Did you know that the commander of a military base in New York State has court orders of protection to keep specific nonviolent peace activists away from his base to ensure his physical safety, or perhaps his peace of mind? And of course, millions of Americans who tolerate or celebrate wars or climate destruction are wonderful and even heroic in their families and neighborhoods and towns, and that's valuable too. And I've been cheering, I will confess, up until recently for the U.S. in the World Cup games. But I cheer for neighborhood and city and regional teams, and I don't talk about the teams as if I'm them. I don't say, we scored, as I sit on a chair opening a beer. And I don't say, we won, when the U.S. military destroys a nation, kills huge numbers of people, poisons the earth, water and air, creates new enemies, wastes trillions of dollars, and passes its old weapons to the local police who restrict my rights in the name of wars fought in the name of freedom. I don't say we lost either. We who resist, I think, have a responsibility to resist harder, but not to identify with the killers, and certainly not to imagine that the men, women, and children and infants being murdered by the hundreds of thousands constitute an opposing team wearing a different uniform, a team whose defeat by Hellfire Missile I should cheer for. Identifying with my street or my town or my continent doesn't lead the same places that identifying with the military plus some minor side services that calls itself my national government leads. And it's very hard to identify with my street. I have such little control over what my neighbors do. And I can't manage to identify with my state because I've never seen most of it. So once I start identifying abstractly with people I don't know, I see no sensible argument for stopping anywhere short of identifying with everybody rather than leaving out 95% and identifying with the United States. Leaving out 90% and identifying with the so-called international community that cooperates with U.S. wars. Why not? just identify with all humans everywhere. And on those rare occasions when we learn the personal stories of distant or disparaged people, we're supposed to remark, wow, that really humanizes them. Well, I'd like to know, what were they before those details made them humanized? In the U.S., there are U.S. flags everywhere, all the time now. And there's a military holiday for each and every day of the year. But the 4th of July is the highest holiday of holy nationalism. More than any other day, you are likely to see children being taught to pledge allegiance to a flag like little robotic fascists. You are more likely to hear the U.S. national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. Who knows which war the words from that national anthem come from? Anybody? There have been quite a few. The War for Canadian Liberation, which in the United States tried to liberate the Canadians, not for the first time or the last time, who welcomed them exactly as the Iraqis would later do, and a war which got the British to burn Washington to the ground, also known as the War of 1812, the bicentennial of which was actually celebrated a couple of years ago in the United States. During that war, which killed thousands of Americans and Brits, mostly through diseases, 
During one pointless, bloody battle among others, plenty of people died, but a flag survived. And so we celebrate the survival of the flag by singing about the land of the free that imprisons more people than anywhere else on earth and the home of the brave that strip searches airline passengers and launches wars if three Muslims say boo. Did you know that the U.S. flag has been recalled? You know how a car will get recalled by the manufacturer if the brakes don't work? There's a magazine, a satirical magazine in the United States called The Onion, reported that the U.S. flag has been recalled after resulting in 143 million deaths, dating back to 1776. Better late than never. There are many wonderful and rapidly improving elements in the U.S. culture. It has become widely and increasingly unacceptable to be bigoted or prejudiced against people, at least nearby people, because of their race or sex or sexual orientation or other factors. It still goes on, of course, but it's frowned upon. I had a conversation last year with a man sitting in the shadow of a carving of Confederate generals on a spot that used to be sacred to the Ku Klux Klan, and I realized that he would never even if he thought it, say something racist about blacks in the United States to a stranger he'd just met. And then he told me he'd like to see the entire Middle East wiped out with nuclear bombs. Yeah. We have had comedians and columnists' careers ended over racist or sexist remarks, but weapons CEOs joke on the radio about it wanting big new occupations of certain countries, and nobody blinks. We have anti-war groups that push for celebration of the military on Memorial Day and other days like this one. We have so-called progressive politicians who describe the military as a jobs program, even though it actually produces fewer jobs per dollar than education or energy or infrastructure or never taking those tax dollars at all. We have peace groups that argue against wars on the ground that the military needs to be ready for more wars, possibly more important wars. We have peace groups that oppose military waste when the alternative of military efficiency is not what we want. We have libertarians, these are unique I think to our country, who oppose wars because they cost money exactly as they oppose schools and parks and everything else. We have humanitarian warriors who argue for wars because of their compassion for the people they want to see bombed. We have peace groups that side with the libertarians and urge selfishness arguing for schools at home instead of bombs for Syrians without explaining that we could give actual aid to Syrians and ourselves for a fraction of the cost of the bombs. We have liberal lawyers who say they can't tell whether blowing children up with drones is legal or not because President Obama has a secret memo, now only partially secret, in which he legalizes it by making it part of a war and they haven't seen the memo and as a matter of principle, they, like Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, ignore the UN Charter and the kellogg Briand Pact and the illegality of war. We have people arguing that bombing Iraq is now a good thing because it finally gets the US and Iran talking to each other. We have steadfast refusals to mention a half million to a million and a half Iraqis dead based on the belief that Americans can only possibly care about the 4,000 Americans killed in Iraq. We have earnest crusades to turn the U.S. military into a force for good, and the inevitable demand of those who begin to turn against war that the United States must lead the way to peace, when of course the world would be thrilled if it just brought up the rear. And yet, we also have tremendous progress. A hundred years ago, Americans were listening to snappy tunes about how hunting Huns was a fun game to play, and professors were teaching that war builds national character. Now, war has to be sold as necessary and humanitarian because nobody believes it's fun or good for you anymore. Polls in the United States put support for possible new wars below 20% and often below 10%. After the House of Commons over here said no, to missile strikes on Syria, Congress listened to an enormous public uproar in the U.S. and said no as well. In February, public pressure led to Congress backing off on a new sanctions bill on Iran that became widely understood as a step toward war rather than away from it. A new war on Iraq is having to be sold and developed slowly in the face of huge public resistance that has even resulted in some prominent advocates of war in 2003 recently recanting. This shift in attitude towards 
Wars is largely the result of the wars on Afghanistan and Iraq and the exposure of the lies and horrors involved. We shouldn't underestimate this trend or imagine that it's unique to the question of Syria or Ukraine. People are turning against war. For some, it may be all about the money. For others, it may be a question of which political party owns the White House. The Washington Post had a poll showing that almost nobody in the United States can find Ukraine on a map. And those who place it furthest from where it really lies are more likely to want the U.S. to attack Ukraine, including those who place Ukraine in the United States. <laughs> now, you don't know whether to laugh or cry, but the larger trend is this. From geniuses right down to morons, we are, most of us, turning against war. The Americans who want Ukraine attacked are fewer than those believing in ghosts, UFOs, or the benefits of climate change. Now, the question is whether we can shake off the idea that after hundreds of bad wars, there just might still be a good one around the corner. To do that, we have to recognize that wars and militaries make us less safe, not safer. We have to understand that Iraqis aren't ungrateful because they're stupid, but because the U.S. and allies destroyed their home. And we can pile more weight on the argument for ending the entire institution of war. These U.S. spy bases are used for targeting missiles, but also for spying on governments and companies and activists. And what justifies the secrecy? What allows treating everyone as an enemy? Well, one necessary component is the concept of an enemy. Without wars, nations lose their enemies. Without enemies, nations lose excuses to abuse people. Britain was the first enemy manufactured by the would-be rulers of the United States on July 4th, 1776. And yet King George's abuses do not measure up to the abuses our governments now engage in, justified by their traditions of war making and enabled by the sort of technologies housed here. War is our worst destroyer of the natural environment, the worst generator of human rights abuses, a leading cause of death and creator of refugee crises. It swallows some $2 trillion a year globally, while tens of billions could alleviate incredible suffering, and hundreds of billions could pay for a massive shift to renewable energies that might help protect us from an actual danger. What we need now is a movement of education and lobbying and nonviolent resistance that doesn't try to civilize war, but to take steps in the direction of abolishing it, which begins by realizing that we can abolish it. If we can stop missiles into Syria, there is no magical force that prevents our stopping missiles into every other country. War is not a primal urge of nations that must burst out a little later if once suppressed. Nations are not real like that. War is a decision made by people, and one that we can make utterly unacceptable. People in dozens of countries are now working on a campaign that I'm part of for the elimination of all war called World Beyond War. And you can check out worldbeyondwar.org or talk to me about getting involved. Our goal is to bring many more people and organizations into a movement not aimed at a specific war proposal from a specific government, but at the entire institution of war everywhere. We'll have to work globally to do this. We'll have to throw our support behind the work being done by groups like the Campaign for Accountability of American Bases and the Movement for the Abolition of War and the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament and Veterans for Peace and so many, many more. Some friends of ours in Afghanistan, the Afghan Peace Volunteers, have proposed that everyone living under the same blue sky who wants to move the world beyond war wear a sky blue scarf. You can make one or you can get them at thebluescarf.org and I hope by wearing this one to communicate my sense of connection to those back in the United States working for actual freedom and bravery and my same sense of connection to those in the rest of the world who have had enough of war. And I'll be signing books down that way and happy 4th of July. Thank you. Leslie, do you want to say something? No.